Hi all, welcome to our video looking at our first case study uh, that we're going to be looking at as part of the population geography topic and we're going to have two case studies and they're both going to look at different sides of migration. Now first, before we get into our case study we need to establish a couple of key points before we move any further. The first is what are some of the different types of migration that we get. Now I've got 10 different types of migration here and there's some overlap between them but if we kind of blitz through them fairly quickly uh, we'll get temporary and seasonal migration which go together quite neatly as if you know we're obviously talking about a temporary migrant is somebody who is not intending to permanently settle somewhere uh, so that can be over seasons so it might well be somebody who moves for instance from an urban area into the countryside for a fruit picking season for example or it might be slightly longer term where you might have somebody who is a student who moves to another country to attend university for a number of years, but with the intention of moving back to their, their home country at the end of it. Uh, you've then also got permanent migrants, who, which is very much what it sounds like, is somebody who moves to somewhere else, and the intention is for that move to be a permanent one. Uh, if we've got voluntary migrants and forced migrants, is where we're looking at the difference between you choosing to move somewhere, being a voluntary migrant, and you having to move somewhere because you are in fear for your life or your well-being. Uh, or, or the kind of well-being of those around you. Uh, two other little kind of subdivisions we've got if we look at the other side, international and intranational migrants. International is what it sounds like, you are moving between two different nations, and intranational is where you are moving within one nation. Uh, both very, very common, but both common in different areas. Uh, if you're an economic migrant, you could be any of the migrant types that have came before this, uh, with the exception of a forced migrant. Uh, is you are moving to better yourself in terms of your ability to earn money. You might be a, a, a plumber, uh, and well, one of the ones that we'll be talking about today with a first case study, if you are a, a, Pol a Polish plumber, you might well like to move to the UK because you know that by doing the same job you can earn more money in a different nation. Uh, the last two we've got here fall under the forced uh, migration category. If you're a refugee and you're an asylum seeker, you are moving from your country of origin or the, the, your place of origin because you are in fear for your life. You are either being persecuted for potentially your political beliefs, uh, it could be your ethnicity, uh, or it is a case where there, uh, it could have been an actual disaster which has hit your country so hard that you've got no choice but to flee. And that makes you a refugee. Uh, an asylum seeker would then be what you would become when you move into a host nation and you are requesting asylum, you're, just, you're requesting sanctuary from that nation, and then there are rules, there are laws that govern how countries should determine whether or not they grant asylum to people. Now, a huge amount of push and pull factors is something that we're going to be talking about a fair amount as we go throughout our different case studies, but this all settles down to why is it people migrate in the first place. Now, the push factors to begin there, you might be looking for better jobs, Better opportunities in terms of education, better opportunities for your family, for uh, better healthcare. It could be anything along that line. You might not have many amenities. The, and again, Mary's back up with the opportunity stuff. You could be looking at you don't have access to good schools. You don't have access to good healthcare. You don't have access to uh, employers that are willing to pay a lot of money. You might have a very, very poor uh, climate that doesn't lend itself to farming. All of these kinds of things are push factors. It's a lack of something that's going to push you away. Uh, the, the poor climate, as I've just mentioned, is a natural factor. You could also have things like uh, a major drought. Uh, you could have natural disasters. You could have a major earthquake, a major volcanic eruption, a, a tropical storm. That All of these things create a situation where you want to leave the area you are in. Uh, you could have political issues. There might be a war. Uh, there might be civil unrest. Somebody might be elected to power who is on a platform where they are going to persecute you. All of these things are going to mean that you want to leave the place you're in and go somewhere else. Uh, and lack of service provision, very similar to lack of amenities. Uh, you know, there might not be uh, good teaching, all this kind of stuff. It's actually very similar. It's the same as um, lack of amenities. Uh, when we go to pull factors, you know, I've written MIRROR in all caps because you can take all the stuff we mentioned as push factors, flip them in their heads and say that they're pull factors. If the place has got lots of jobs, lots of opportunities, brilliant schooling, brilliant healthcare, eh, no issues with natural disasters, a very stable and equitable government, all of these things are going to want to draw you into an area. 
Uh, also, you know, you might move to an area for, uh, you know, for kind of fluffier reasons, and uh, that you just want to be in that place. You know, people move to, uh, to, to Paris because they just want to live there. Um, that is an element of it as well. And the last thing we've got here, kind of in, uh, in quotation marks, is the bright city lights. Rural to urban migration is one of the biggest forms of migration that we're seeing, as I've mentioned this previously, but we are, for the first time, living in a world where more people live in urban areas than live in rural areas. It's the first time in human history this has been the case. And it's this association of urban areas with opportunity and with the ability to, you know, basically better your life. You know, another kind of quite cheesy saying, you know, the streets are paved with gold. Um, it's this whole idea that draw people into these urban areas. A lot of the time they get a bit of a shock because a lot of the time the urban areas aren't all they're cracked up to be. Uh, but that is nonetheless one of the reasons we see that type of migration. Now, first case study we're going to look at is a voluntary migration. Uh, it's more often than not, I look at an economic migration, and it's Poles moving to Scotland. Now, the first thing we look at whenever we look at these uh, case studies, we look at push and pull factors, and then we look at the consequences of the migration on both the host nation and the receiving nation. So push and pull factors, uh, to start us off, in 2004, uh, Polish unemployment levels were 20%, so one in five people was unemployed. Uh, wages were around about a third of the wages for the same job, or for an equivalent job, that people would have been paid in Scotland. There were pretty major housing shortages, so young people were in a position where they had to live at home, because there just weren't houses available for them to purchase. Uh, and the state benefits were re are reasonably minimal, you know, that kind of support you get from the state just wasn't really there. Pull factors, well, one big one, and this obviously, given the current political climate, is no longer going to be a thing uh, in the reasonably imminent future. Um, but the Scotland is an EU member state, as is Poland, and that means there's freedom of movement. So there aren't any barriers for a Polish person who wanted to come and work and live in Scotland in terms of visas and things like that that might have been the case if they were moving out with the EU. Uh, you also had a very favourable exchange rate between Sterling and the Zloty, uh, which meant that sending money back home as remittance payments was really quite profitable. Uh, you, you were getting kind of good bang for your buck, to pardon the pun, uh, on the exchange rate. Um, most jobs in the UK, the money you earn will exceed your cost of living. Now that means you can afford to send these remittance payments that I'm talking about back to Poland. People could come to Scotland, what? earn enough to sustain themselves and still have money left over to send back to a family back in Poland to help them out. Uh, a lot of the jobs were people coming with skills they already had to vacancies that were here in Scotland. So things like construction, uh, plumbing, uh, electricians, general tradesmen style jobs or trade style jobs where things where there was areas of unemployment in Scotland and there were people from Poland with those skills who could come over to Scotland and take the jobs and actually fill them because they weren't being filled by people who were already in the country. Now the big meat of this, what is the impact that that's, this has had? What are the consequences that it's had? So this is a big diagram and there's not a huge amount on it but obviously I am expecting you to kind of uh, pad this out as there is a lot that we can talk about it. You know, a human consequence is that at the time Scotland's birth rate was on the decrease, Scotland's population was ageing and that was an issue. So the Scottish government was all too happy for, as a rule, younger Polish people to come to the country who were of a working age, so they were contributing to the economy, and having children. So they were helping to boost the, the birth rate in Scotland and helping to offset the increasing average national age. Uh, politically, there have been, and you'll have seen this kind of stuff in newspapers, where people say, we're going to be overrun by, by different migrants and there'll be Romanians everywhere, and it's, it's mega, mega, mega sensationalised in the media. It is something that was floated as a concern and a, as a consequence of this migration, but it's something that really just didn't pan out. Uh, it wasn't something that was a problem, and there is, you know, more or less every community uh, that has had an influx of, of uh, Polish migrants in Scotland has had a very positive experience with it. Uh, and this is where we come to the economic side of it. Now, for Poland, the, the economic side of it is it isn't brilliant because you've got a brain drain. If your young working population is leaving, that's potentially problematic for your country. You are losing an economic resource. Now, however, it was offset somewhat by the remittance payments that the Poles were sending back. So as much as they're not in your country earning money, they're still sending money 
to the uh, to Poland, which is being spent in Poland and is helping to boost the Polish economy that way, but not as much as if they were still in the country working. They have been a huge boost to the Scottish economy. You know, they come over, they work, pay taxes, buy stuff, etc., etc., and this boosts the economy. It is a massive bonus. Um, socially and culturally, there tends not to be many migrations, certainly not between developed nations, where the social cultural exchange isn't a positive one, and this has very much been the case with Poles moving to Scotland. You know, they inject new life into a culture, uh, you know, where you get new kind of styles of food, uh, styles of dress, music, etc, etc. They get injected into the culture, and it is generally extremely positive. Now, I'm going to wrap this one up here. This is one of our case studies. They say, in an exam context, the kinds of things that you'd be expected to be able to discuss would be things like this. Uh, for a voluntary migration, you have studied what are the consequences on the host and donor nations. Um, and this is where you're expected to take the kinds of information that we've been discussing in today's video, along with some other stuff that will obviously add to this in class and be able to explain it out fully. Our next video is going to look at a forced migration and we'll discuss that next week. And until then, I'll see you guys later.